Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, I uh, definitely have a passion for bluebirds and so Ron and some other of our colleagues here at the Extension uh, Volunteer Organization, uh, Cherokee County. Uh, I uh, hope you guys are having a great Friday. Uh, uh, looking forward to a nice weekend with uh, some nice weather. Um, the Bluebird, uh, our title for our presentation is Building a Bluebird Paradise. So it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're, we're trying to do is build a perfect place, if you could, uh, for bluebirds to uh, live in our, in our habitat. Um, the uh, presentation, let's see, I'm having some issues with a there we go. Uh, first, a few fun facts about bluebirds. They are known, and many have heard, as the harbinger of happiness. And they definitely are very delightful to see. Uh, both the males, very colorful males, and the females, more muted, but still beautiful. Um, they are amazing birds. Uh, they can see quite a distance uh, uh, to, to gather food, the prey. Uh, 60 feet or more. Uh, and another interesting thing about bluebirds is the, the pair bond often remains intact for several seasons. Uh, so it, it's just very interesting that a bird would maintain that kind of a longevity of a, of a relationship. Uh, now, another very interesting part of it, and you ladies out there might be interested, is that the female does all the nest building. Hmm, what does that say? I don't know. Uh, Anyways, let's not go further on that subject. Uh, today's objectives are that we are excited about bluebirds and we want to share that excitement with you and get you excited too. So uh, our objective is to get you excited and to encourage you to attract them to your own property and to the community that you live. Uh, and we basically want to enlist your help to increase their local and overall population. Um, and and I'll, we have a lot to talk about today. So and I just, in this one next slide, present the basic outline. So the first thing I wanna ask is, why do we wanna attract bluebirds? But then after that, uh, I wanna talk about bluebird ecology. There's what species there are, their ranges, characteristics, habitat, food, that sort of thing. Uh, then I wanna talk, switching gears a little bit, talk about what we have done here in our community of Cherokee County, Georgia, to build some bluebird trails. Um, and then I wanna switch gears again and talk a little bit more about how, what you can do to attract bluebirds in your own property and community. Uh, more of a hands-on type of practic practical information. And then uh, least, uh, last but not least by any means, uh, Ron uh, and I uh, uh, filmed a little uh, do-it-yourself video on how to build a bluebird box. So that hopefully give you some tools to actually do it yourself at home. So uh, Hopefully with the end, at the end of this presentation, you have not only an idea of where to put the box, but how to build it. So first question, why bluebird nest boxes? Why do we want to build them? Well, bluebirds are not currently endangered. So why, well, why do we want to do anything? Well, uh, you have to go back a little bit into history. Uh, they're important because they provide nesting sites for these birds. These are, these are, uh, birds are cavity dwellers. Uh, and in the past, starting in the late 1800s, all the way through into the 1950s, there was a loss of habitat and nesting sites. Uh, and there was some competition for non-native uh, non -native birds uh, for their cavities. Uh, so we saw a significant decline in the population. Um, at this point, uh, about 1950s, there was a movement to construct uh, bluebird trails and to build nest uh, boxes. And that, that uh, activity has really turned things around. So it is important to have plenty possible homes for the bluebirds. And it's the humans that can help this process. Um, but there are other reasons to, 
to uh, build nest boxes, bluebird nest boxes. First, they eat insects. Now, I'll admit, not necessarily flying insects, so it might not help the mosquito population, but they do eat bugs. And a good example of that is in my own garden, I have no trouble with tomato hornworms, which plague others. And I don't use insecticides on these tomatoes. Uh, bluebirds go in, I watch them, and eat all those caterpillars. Uh, it's amazing. So it's good to have a bug eater in your yard. But in addition to that, they're just great to have around. They're beautiful. Uh, the blue flash or the male especially is just great. Pleasant, swan, uh, sweet song. Uh, and I mentioned already is that they are harbingers of happiness. So just seeing them, uh, it's, it it's just raises your spirit. So uh, it's just great to, to have them around. Uh, uh, now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the bluebird itself. Uh, they're a small thrush, so in that, that family. Their, their scientific name, and I hope I don't mess this up, is Cialia cialis. Um, there are, are only three species, uh, and they're in North America. There's the eastern bluebird, the mountain bluebird, and the western bluebird. They're similar, but they are... Uh, they also differ. Now, the pictures I show here, I'm not sure you can see the upper right one, but that's the Eastern Bluebird. But I show a picture of each one and you can see slightly different uh, uh, body shape and colors. Now, each has its own range. Uh, the Western Bluebird occupies the Western part of, of, of the North American continent, pretty much Mexico, US into Canada. And they are really in the mountainous areas and it's in the Sierras. The, the mountain bluebird has a wider range, a little bit more northerly, and it's uh, more in the mountain area. Now, the eastern bluebird, the only one that we have here in Georgia, occupies the eastern part of the U.S. primarily, a little bit into Mexico and a little bit into Canada. Now, uh, they in, in these, these uh, ranges, they show several colors. The, the orange is the breeding area. Uh, the uh, darker, the purplish uh, is the year round. So they breed and winter in the purpley area. And the blue is the non-breeding area. So that's more of the winter range. Um, now uh, the bluebirds uh, have uh, a very beautiful color pattern. Uh, the males are di vivid deep blue above, rusty brick red on the throat and breast. Just a delightful uh, view. The females, like all birds, or most birds, they're very much muted. So the colors are more grayish above, bluish wings, and more subdued orange uh, breast. Uh, the immature birds, now they start off featherless, like most birds, and then they develop uh, in, the, in their first immature year. They, uh, by the end of that year, they look more female, uh, and they'll get that vivid color as they mature. Now, they have spotted uh, early on uh, feather uh, color patteration, uh, pattern. So you'll see them. And that's, I think, typical of thrushes, the spots on the, the, the fledglings and the, uh, the babies. Um, they have uh, their eggs, pale blue, very nice color to see. And you can almost uh, just obviously see it's a bluebird by the color of the egg. Sometimes the eggs are whiter or not quite as deep blue. They have seven, two to seven eggs per clutch. The incubation period, 11 to 19 days, and the brooding period, 17 to 19. Now these, these time frames are important when you start observing the bluebirds in their boxes. And one of the key things is in the brooding period, you don't want to open the nest. It's the only time you can't, uh, don't want to, is when they're getting ready to fledge. Uh, the number of broods per year can depend on the food sources and the quality of the habitat, and it can be from one to three uh, per year. Oh, and I didn't say what these pictures are showing you the various stages, the eggs, the, uh, the hatchlings, uh, the, uh, the fledglings, and then as they uh, are emerge from the nest, the, at this last picture on the right is a, looks like the daddy bird feeding one of the babies. So now their habitat. They like open areas, open woodland, not much understory, sparse ground cover. Uh, they like grasslands, open pastures, fields, 
suburban parks, backyards, big backyards, golf courses. And the reason for that is they have, uh, as I mentioned, they eat bugs and they primarily catch these bugs on the ground, not flying. Uh, so they'll, they'll sit on a perch somewhere and uh, they need a clear view, that excellent vision, and they'll fly down and catch that bug. So this, they eat caterpillars, beetles, crickets, uh, grasshoppers, spiders, and the like. Uh, now in the fall, they switch over. Bug population drops. Uh, they switch over to a fruit type of diet. Uh, and in, in that way, they're omnivores. Uh, and so uh, they'll, they'll eat mistletoe, berries, uh, sumac, blueberries, if any are there, uh, black cherry, that kind of thing, uh, juniper berries. So just as a hint, you might want to have some of these in your yard or in the area where you're going to, uh, if you want to put some birds in your property. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, they perch on wires, fence posts, uh, bare tree limbs, uh, and they overlook these fields. And so you often see them, as in the picture here, sitting on a fence post. Uh, and it's a very characteristic picture for a bluebird. Uh, and I mentioned they can see quite a distance. So that's what they're doing. They're looking for that prey, those bugs on the ground. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they're cavity, uh, cavity dwellers. Uh, the, the, the males attract the females by uh, commandeering a nest site and then displaying uh, a small amount of nesting material and walking or going back and forth inside the nest. Once the female sees this activity and decides he's the guy, uh, she'll actually do the nest building, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the nest is made out of loosely uh, weaved grass and pine needles, and it's lined with fine grasses. Now, you'll see this in this picture on the right. Uh, it's very characteristic of a bluebird to have a pine, a lot of pine needles in the nest. And it, it's almost a sure sign that it's a bluebird. If the nest material is coarse, uh, probably not a bluebird. Now I mentioned earlier, the pair bond remains for several seasons typically, and both the male and female feed the clutch. Sometimes the female decides to take a vacation. So, uh, and then it, le it leaves the male to feed, but also sometimes the young birds from the first brood will help the parents feed the broods that follow. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, biology uh, in, in, and behavior. Um, as I mentioned, they're cavity dwellers. So they'll go with either a natural cavity or artificial cavity. Now, uh, as I mentioned too, is that they lost a lot of these natural cavities as people cleared the land and the forest. So, um, but they, they will go to an old woodpecker hole in a dead pine or an oak tree. And typically they'll go up high in the tree but they also will go to a nest box, which is where we come in. The older birds really prefer to go to these more than the younger ones, but that nest box uh, needs to be about three to 20 feet high. Low is good for us, high is better for them. Uh, now, switching gears, as I mentioned, um, I am excited and, and we have a small group of, of master gardeners, master naturalists, who are excited about bluebirds. And we really wanted to do something in our community. And so what we did is we ended up putting in three blueberry trails, uh, one in, in, in Cherokee County, one in Heritage Park, one in Etowah River Park, and the other at Un uh, Reinhardt University. Um, the, uh, the, and I'll talk a little bit about these to kind of give you, and the purpose here is to give you an idea of what you could do if you wanted to do something like this. So the, Edo, the Heritage and Edo River Park projects were started in the early part of 2019. Uh, Russell Brannan, another master gardener, master naturalist, uh, Josh Fooder and myself built 18 nest boxes. And Josh was uh, able to obtain posts and uh, we bought and funding for predator guards for the boxes. And then very important if you wanna do a project like this is to get permission if you put them in a public place from whatever authority has uh, to give that permission. 
In this case, it was the city of Canton. So in this, this picture here, we show the two parks that are adjacent, they're connected by a walking trail and a bridge. And you can see the little, the little pins on it where we put the boxes. Uh, all, it all, uh, it was a pretty easy job. I think it took us two days uh, to put the posts and we pre-built the boxes during the winter season. But it uh, definitely want to get permission from whatever authority has uh, to get before you put these boxes in. So now here's a, one of the boxes we put in at Heritage and in, 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 in Etowah River, uh, we put it shown on the left. Uh, and uh, you can see the post we put it on. And on the right, a picture of uh, Russell, Josh, and myself uh, who, when we put them up. And we actually had a newspaper article written about this uh, trail uh, uh, development. And uh, so it, it, it was something that we were happy to see, to share with the public, to maybe get some more excitement in, in the project. Um, now, more recently, uh, this past summer, uh, there were a group, I was Russell, uh, Ron, uh, and I was supposed to and backed out of this somehow or another and not, didn't get caught. Uh, we were planning to build bird houses. Well, Ron, Russell and Ron built 10, um, but I tried to pick up some of the slack by contacting and trying to get a place to put these bird houses. So I contacted Reinhardt University staff and they were very interested in putting them on their campus. And uh, uh, we put eight bird houses on their campus. And uh, Russell and, and myself worked with the Reinhardt staff, very, very friendly and very helpful folks to actually place them on the campus. So uh, Russell and I went around looking for suitable sites and the campus folks uh, helped us do it. Uh, and you can see on the lower left, the campus folks, uh, they really made it. They got the post for us and bought the predator guards. The middle picture is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the group of us involved in the project, uh, uh, Ron, Josh, myself, and Russell. And you can see on the picture on the right, Russell helping put one of the boxes up on the Reinhardt campus. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, the third project, and this is one that's coming up. We haven't started it other than we have bird houses, two bird houses prepared and built. Uh, we plan to install two nest boxes at the Veterans Park Educational Garden uh, and Orchard. Now this, this little uh, orchard uh, is a demonstration uh, orchard and garden. And it's one that Josh Fooder is very close to his heart. He's been working on this for uh, a year or more. Uh, and we now have it in the park and it's just the perfect place for a bluebird. And you can see the picture on the left, very open area. Uh, and we're gonna put in this little garden, a demonstration uh, orchard where we have apples, uh, peaches, uh, pears, figs. We have raised beds. We have uh, blackberries, uh, blueberries. Uh, uh, we'll have a fig tree. I mean, it's going to be loaded with stuff and it's going to be open to the public for educational purposes. We'll have a little greenhouse eventually, we hope. But this whole park, this is a small part of the Veterans Park here in Cherokee County. It's a very large park and it's really ripe for putting a lot of bluebirds in areas where people can see them and they have the right uh, place to, to grow and, and, and increase in population. So we're excited about this project. I think it's gonna be a fantastic success. Coming up and if you're interested, I might be going out quote on a limb, but uh, I, I really want people to get excited. I and mean, if you're interested in building some boxes, Maybe you could, could help us out here. So uh, switching gears again. Now, this part of the presentation is about how you can do build and maintain your own bluebird nesting area in your yard or in the community around your house or even in our greater community in the, in the uh, county. So we're going to talk about the building uh, the, the, the bluebird nest box, give you some plans, uh, where to put it. Uh, we talk generalities, but we're gonna talk very specific, what, where to and not to put things, put these houses. And then we wanna talk a little bit about the inspection and maintenance of the nest box, box and habitat. And uh, 
we, uh, we're going to present a video on this at the end of this, as I mentioned in the beginning, on the actual demonstration of how to, to build a Bluebird box. So that's where Ron's going to be coming in and talking about that part of it. Uh, so the Bluebird nest box, here's some really good plans uh, that Ron and I pulled off off the internet. There are many, many versions of these Bluebird boxes. They have some things in common, but uh, there's a few features that some don't share. Uh, one is uh, that you really want to incorporate. One is that it has a side or front opening door. This is really important for inspection and maintenance of that house. Uh, and uh, another feature that we want to talk about and make sure that you're aware of is having a predator guard. I've seen snakes crawl up uh, these uh, metal posts, uh, no trouble at all. So the, the, we want to put some kind of protection for the bluebird uh, house itself, prevent those kind of creatures from getting in and disturbing their peace. And actually, if they do, they won't go back quickly. So this particular plan is made out of four, a four foot section of uh, one by six, and you can use pine or oak, whatever you find available. Maybe you could even go dumpster diving and find some uh, wood that would fit your need. Uh, so, but it's pretty inexpensive, easy to build, and we're gonna talk about how to build it a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, the next slide here shows kind of how we install the Bluebirds box. This is a, a stock photo, but, but you see the predator guard that the, the box is on a post. Uh, and in this case, it looks like a T post. Uh, and then there's a predator guard hanging below it. Now, uh, I like metal better than a wood post because it's harder for predators to get up the metal post, but, but they can get up anything. So you got to have this predator guard. And what we use is a stove pipe you can buy at any big box store. Uh, and and uh, we hooked it up to the post. You can hook it up. If the post has holes in it, great. You just have to use one of those holes and, and hang a wire and drill a couple of holes in the stove pipe and just hang it on the post itself. Or if you, if you want, you could tie that wire up tightly uh, against the post and just hang the wire, you know, again, drill two holes in the stove pipe and hang it on those wires. Or if you have the tools, you can drill a hole in the in the uh, the T post or whatever you have, and then use that as a point of contact for the holding the, the stovepipe predator guard. Um, but in any case, uh, for what we did is we stuffed some old grocery plastic sacks in in the top of this little stovepipe, kind of as a further deterrent. And we actually went even beyond that. We even had some of that. Uh, that foam stuff, uh, great foam, whatever they call it, uh, and we foam the top uh, of the of the predator guard, kind of extra assurance. So you can do whatever you think is right, good, but you don't want a predator in your box if you can at all prevent it. Oh, I meant to go to the next slide. Let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, some practical advice on where to put this bluebird box once you build it. Uh, you you want to put it at the edge of a large open area, one and a half to two acres, possibly. You can go smaller, but uh, it should be a big field, grassy, preferably, or lawn. You want to put it 50 feet away from any dense cover, shrubs, thickets, and woods, because remember, they're looking at insects on the ground to eat and to feed their babies. So you want to have that open area so they can find those bugs on the ground. And you want to put it away from bird feeders and other structures uh, like homes and sheds and outbuildings. And the reason for that is that if you put it near those objects, other birds come, they see the nest box. If they're nest cavity dwellers, they will come and try to fight with the bluebirds. And this is the early reason, one of the reasons that they lost their habitat early in the uh, in, in the 1800s, before 1950, they lost the cavity uh, uh, cavity houses. Uh, so you really want to keep these uh, other birds from looking and even finding these boxes. And another thing you want to do is face the entrance away from the west, away from the north or the northwest. Uh, hey, personal experience here, don't do it. 
uh, you want to face it in those other directions. And primarily, I think it's due to storms, uh, either summer or winter, that, that cause the birds to be disturbed. So the other thing is you want to space them apart. 200 and 300 feet are good. But if you have a smaller area, you can put it so that they the, a bird on one house can't see another house. And, and that's probably just as well. So we've done this in my backyard. We don't have the big wide open area. It's big, but not totally that large acre and a half. So we just place them so that the one bird can't see the other bird on this box. It seems to work. Now, one of the things that's important uh, is, as I mentioned earlier, is inspecting and maintaining these boxes. So you really do want to inspect these nest boxes during the nesting season. So you basically keep tab if there's a problem that develops. Sometimes you get wasps that go in these boxes, so you want to take care of that right away. So you want to look in these boxes every other week, maybe. Um, so uh, and also very important uh, for the long term health of the species uh, is to collect data. And there's a great application. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, cell phone application it's called NetWatch, uh, NestWatch. It's uh, you can put it on your phone. It's something that Cornell Lab, and that's the, the same lab that uh, I got a lot of this information from. Uh, you can log in and it gives you, you, you can put in data, like for example, how many bird, bluebirds you saw in the area, or any bird for that matter, how many eggs were in the nest, when they formed the nest, uh, how many hatchlings occurred, you know, when they fledged, uh, all that kind of stuff goes into this database, really easy to enter, uh, but it's very useful because it creates real-time viable data for both universities and organizations who want to further, uh, in, in particular, bluebird population. So, and, and the other thing, you do want to go back and have an owner for this box because you do need to refurbish these boxes periodically, at least annually to make sure that they're not falling apart because often you build them out of somewhat inferior lumber. You, you, know, you might want to repaint them, whatever. So it's uh, all good, all good. So uh, at this point, we're gonna switch gears again. Uh, uh, we wanna show you this little video that, that Ron uh, uh, and I uh, created over the weekend. And it's talking about how to build a bluebird box, practical guide. So I'll leave the show to Ron at this point. Um, and uh, it's all yours, Ron. Thanks, Mike. I, I, you did an excellent job with this. Um, am I on this thing also? No, you're on this screen. Okay, but I'm not. I know. Okay. But what we're going to do is talk about this blue bird house that I'm holding in front of you. But if you're going to observe uh, a video, the idea is to take an eight foot by six inch board and make two bird houses. And we're going to show you very briefly how to, to do it. Keep one for yourself and give it to a good friend or give it to a grandma. Uh, I normally make a couple of bluebird houses, give them away as Christmas gifts to neighbors or friends, people that least suspect anything and give them something that they will remember for the next couple of years. Not only enjoy the gift, but also enjoy the bird as they uh, observe the bird. So watch the video and we'll talk to you in a, in a little bit. Uh, wrong button. This is a bluebird house that we intend to make today. Let me point out a couple of things. This one is made out of cedar. It uh, has a long lasting. You do not have to. Touch. Read it outside. And this is, uh, as you're going to see, on the wood that we can make uh, two of these out uh, of an eight foot piece of wood that's five and a half inches wide. Notice the curve that's sitting on in front of the uh, the door that the bird goes into. The mother will sit on these with her claws as she feeds the babies with inside. This is not designed to put her in, but to hang on to the front. So a lot of people will make a bluebird 
house without them, they should be included. The overhang should be able to prevent water from coming in from the top of the birdhouse. And this is designed only to attach to a tree or attach to a post, a T-post that you see. You make a blue birdhouse, this is not. This is designed to be unscrewed at the top, clean, cleaned out. But most generally, people will make them whip up and look into the house to observe the birds if you want to. The opening is one and a half inches, and I use a uh, the hole saw to cut that out. The bottom should have drainage in case water gets into it. The water can drain from the bottom. This is cedar. It's the only cedar. This house is about three years old, never been treated, and it's uh, handling the weather pretty well. Okay, what we're going to show you is how to lay out a bluebird house. Real simple. You need a square, you need a pencil, and then you need a measuring tape. You can remember these numbers or you'll see them on the camera. Right here, I start off with the base, which is 14 inches. And then I mark another eight and a half right here, which is the top. That's the hangover on that bluebird house. But you gotta make sure the lines are straight to make this work. And then I've got the top. This is the back, this is the top, and I need two sides but I've got to pitch the sides to drain the water away from the house, from the opening. So the sides you cut at nine and a half inches with three quarter of an inch drop. So you got a very slight slope. And then I need another side, nine inches with three quarter of an inch drop. And so that gives you an angle versus straight across. You have an angle on that road. And then you move from there to the the front of the bluebird house. The front of the bluebird house is eight and a half inches tall. You take this nine inches and you take off that three quarters of an inch, you have a small gap that will allow air to pass through. Then you create an opening for the bluebird to go in. That is two inches from the top of the front, two and a half inches, and it's an inch and a half opening. Now, when you finish this house, before you put it all together, you're going to cut the curves in there for the bluebird to hang on to as they go into the house. And then that's it. Then I start another house. The back is 14 inches. A side, 9 inches. A side, 9 inches. A front, 8.5 inches. Now I've cut the two bottoms for these houses at the end. So out of an eight inch, eight foot board, you can make two bluebird houses, one for yourself and a friend or two for a friend or put them wherever, a school. But out of an eight foot board will cost you about, today's cost on lumber is about $12. And you can get two houses, each house will cost $6. If you did it out of cedar today, it would cost you 20 to $25 per bluebird house. So you can wait till the price of wood comes down both from pine as well as cedar. The negative of pine is what this is. It will have a tendency to bowl. It will not last as long in the weather. And we will paint this before we uh, put it out for the uh, bluebirds. You can paint it any color that you like. Okay, what we have, I measured them off outside for you. And we're going to show you the cut. This is a birdhouse. This is one single birdhouse. And so what I use is a trim is a, uh, a, a trim saw, and I just cut on the line. This is your 14 and a half inch bottom, a back rather, and. Uh, This is one side. Side two. Side three. This is the opening. 
one and a half inch opening for the bird. And here's your bottom. This is the bottom. So this is what you have when you start off at the birdhouse. You have the back, two sides, the front, uh, and I am missing the eight and a half roof. I did not have that marked out. You didn't have the top. So you've got the two sides, the front, the top, the back, and the bottom. That's what you have. So you put all of that together. Uh, but now I've got to cut the angle. Remember, you need a slope, which is an eight degree slope. So I'm going to set this at eight degrees. the slope that the roof sets on it. And then we need to cut the other side, which is at eight degrees. We begin to assemble the bluebird house. So we're going to mark about two inches from the bottom of the back board. And we're going to make that the bottom of the house itself. And you remember that each one of these sloped at the top. I'm going to begin to assemble this. You can hammer a nail if you want versus the uh, nail gun if you like. Nail gun. Cleaner, no hammer marks on the wood. First, let's go to the front mount. Is off the box, so we're going to take this two inches from the bottom. Side. 
you can see there's opening on the side to allow air to pass through on the side. You can see there's air right here on the top. And this all gets down to allow air to pass through for the for the birds as well. As you can see, this is the finished project. Uh, the hole is cut one and a half inches. I have not cut the curves to allow the bluebird to land, but this is the finished product. And now what we would do is uh, maybe lightly sand it and then paint it whatever color you would like. We normally try to blend the colors, not put it white, try to blend them into the natural environment where the bird house is going to be put. But this is the finished product. This is what you want. You can make two of these out of an eight foot board. Remember that. And the plans are available on our video. If you have any questions, refer back to the video. And by the way, you can attach it to a T post in the back with two loops, attach onto a T post. You can make that at any height, again, pointing to the uh, south, make the opening pointing to the south, or you can attach it to a tree as long as you've got uh, a good angle for the birds to come in around it. So that's it. Wish you best of luck building one of your own. Okay, what we have, uh, you can see the predator guard on the front. Uh, as you can see right on the front, I'm gonna turn this a little bit of an angle. Uh, the birdhouse we were building there, we did not have a predator guard on it. This is the side that you can lift up to observe uh, the bird inside of the house, as you saw on, on uh, Mike's presentation earlier. So that you did not see in the uh, uh, work that amateur video that we just did. So there's your birdhouse here. I encourage you to make uh, make a couple. If you're making one, make two, and then give one away, or uh, give it to a school, or give it to a friend. But enjoy that one. So, um, any questions uh, here? Wait a minute. Let's go to the next screen. Just a second. Um, just a second. Uh, I need to hear. Okay. Yeah. Now here, I'm going to turn this back over to my thank you great job brian and you know i had a lot of fun uh learning from the pro on how to build stuff quickly i uh, did a great job uh, with the birdhouse uh just remember that you know we were kind of building it in haste and some of those other features we talked about opening the door a little, little bit of a predator guard in the front all nice features uh, for it helps uh, in the long term maintenance. Now, there's a number of references that I used that I, I wanted to share with you. Uh, these references, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, great reference. Uh, it's really good. And this is also the, the, the source of the Nest Watch uh, software, the applica application. Um, there's a number of other good uh, resources, uh, mostly from uh, various like Alabama Extension Service, uh, Kentucky, uh, University of Kentucky, uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources. But one that really was good in the practical side is the Michigan Bluebird Society webpage. And I'll show it here. They really did a good job at describing, um, you know, exact where to place it and that sort of thing. So you might want to go to some of these references and get a better feel uh, for, you know, how to build and 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 also how to um, maintain uh, the birds, the bird houses. So let's see, uh, let's see what we go next. Next slide. First, uh, before we close, I want to thank everybody for participating in, uh, in our program, uh, tuning in and supporting the program. Now we have, as a as Josh mentioned earlier, we have now created uh, uh, close to a dozen video of, of presentation. Uh, on now uh, their Zoom presentations, and they, you can go to uh, the Cherokee County uh, Facebook page, I think, and find them by searching for videos. I'm not sure the exact search mechanism, 
but uh, you can find them by going to Cherokee County Facebook uh, page, Cherokee County, Georgia. Uh, and we, we don't uh, want to forget, uh, too, we, we ask you guys to give us some feedback because that's really how we get better. We're, we uh, are learning. Hopefully, we serve our, uh, well, you well today, but we want to make our program even better. Uh, so at this point, we're open to questions. Uh, and I think uh, at this point, I think, Josh, if you're ready, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ron. A um, couple of things that I thought, you know, might start with on questions because I don't see any in the chat. Um, <clears throat> proximity of houses to other houses. I know you, you've discussed this for a while, but I know I've read and I've experienced this in my own yard. Uh, I have perfect bluebird habitat in that it is a uh, full sun, few big trees. Um, but I think I've read where sometimes it is better to put two houses <clears throat> closer than that 200 to 300 foot spacing in that <clears throat> you will often have uh, tree swallows that will inhabit a nest uh, or compete for a nest but if there's another one close by, the tree swallow will have uh, the ability to make a nest and they can share the same space without competition for those nests. Yeah, that's a good observation. You know, I, I'll be honest with you, Josh. I, I, I always say this to my wife, the, the bird watcher. Uh, you know, birds have bird brains and I just can't figure them out sometimes. So, uh, but I think I've heard uh, where people do put back to back two birdhouses, literally back to back, facing in opposite directions. Now, of course, that may run into a problem. With one of them might be facing north, but but I, I think it it works. Uh, I I think it particularly is useful in a smaller habitat. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, go figure. You know, the birds. If you if you get them, if you do that, and you get them in your yard, hey. It works. So don't argue with success. I hope that helped. Uh, now, there's a lot of resources to go out and look at uh, what works. But, you know, the practical part of it is try it. If it works, go for it. If it doesn't, change it. I hope that uh, helped. One, one trick um, I think I've come across in dealing with uh, paper wasps because uh, these things can get paper wasps in them. Uh, I know especially our our Park Trail, I think we dealt with paper wasps and some of them. Uh, and I think we heard from someone or read somewhere that uh, just rubbing uh, some sort of bar soap on the ceiling on the interior uh, can inhibit those paper wasps from attaching their, their little nest to the top part of the roof, because that's generally where they're going to make their uh, little paper nest. Yeah, now we actually... Uh... We got that from um, the professor at uh, um, Berry College. Uh, I'm trying to remember her her name again, and I, it eludes me at this point. But yeah, that, that was a great idea, and we tried it. Uh, uh, Russell, Russell, and I went out to the Etowa River and Heritage Parks, and it seemed to help. It wasn't a cure all, but it did seem to help. Uh, and I don't know if it's the soap that keeps the wasp from attaching its nest or maybe the smell of it. I don't know, but it, it did seem to reduce the incidence of the number of, of wasps in especially unoccupied uh, nests. If they were occupied, it didn't seem to be as much of a problem. Mm -hmm. And then maybe if you want to discuss, I don't know if you uh, covered it as much, uh, timing as far as getting these things up to ensure they're ready for that uh, first mating slash brooding season? When do, when do we need to have these up by? Well, that's a great question. And you're right. I was uh, uh, probably a too brief in my presentation to, and I should have presented that. Um, the best time uh, is during the winter. So, and, and that's part of the reason we made our presentation on bluebirds now, as opposed to like in the spring. But the best time is, is to get them up because when the males start occupying their territory and trying to you know, mark it out, uh, having a birdhouse there will be the clencher. 
to get the bird to occupy. So now it doesn't mean that you can't put a birdhouse up in the middle of summer. Uh, there may be another newcomer that wants to build there, but the best time is during the winter. And, and if you remember, looking back at those pictures, Dosh, you know, we, we did that uh, during the bleak of winter. And so you have to find your day, but the winter is definitely the best time to put up a bluebird boxes and set up a bluebird trail. So thanks for asking. Up to oh, uh, I had a question uh, from from Ron. He was asking how many clutches per year. Well, it varies uh, from bird to bird, but it, from one to three. You know, it kind of depends on the habitat, how rich it is, and food, uh, how uh, big. Age of the mother too, I think. Yes, uh, and also uh, I've seen cases where. Uh, a predator came in, a snake got in one of my bird boxes, and that was it. So you got the one clutch, that was the end of it. Uh, they went elsewhere. Uh, so uh, it all depends, but one to three is a, a good average to, to use. And if you got three, you should be jumping for joy because it's great. Uh, that, that would be great success. Any good way to know? I know uh, the cat bird is a native bird and it is a uh, parasite in terms of laying one egg in another bird's nest and allowing that bird to uh, nourish it and raise it. There, have you ever seen that in your uh, bird? Uh, no, yeah, no. Way to know oh. that you have a non bluebird in there mixed in with your bluebird nest. Yeah, uh, there, there's a bird, I, I, and I don't know if the cat bird does it, because we have those in our yard too, uh, but there's a cow bird. Cow bird, uh, that's what I meant. Cow okay, uh, the cow bird is a kind of, a, it's kind of an ugly bird, but, but uh, it, and it does have the habit, it doesn't make its own nest. It will lay eggs uh, into another bird, songbird, any bird, a bluebird included, another nest. And their bird, those uh, hatchlings, are bigger, grow faster, eat more, and and outcompete the songbird. And eventually, you know, I mean, that may be the only surviving uh, bird that comes out of the the nest. So, and and it, I think there's some legal requirements about not um, killing these birds because they are part of uh, the natural environment. But they certainly are not. Uh, not um, desirable from the standpoint of uh, not just bluebirds, but any songbird. So you might have to go to your local ordinances and so on to find out what the rules are. I personally do not like them in the nests. And so you can relocate those eggs to some other location, a bird nest that you don't care about, a sparrow, for example. But uh, definitely uh, they're, they're very easily spotted uh, in a bluebird nest because of the color of the eggs, uh, bluebird eggs, bright blue. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things that's in, it's natural. So, you know, you, you, you really don't want to disturb mother nature too much, but if you want to get rid of the, the, the cowbird, uh, you, you might want to, before you do anything, uh, go to local ordinances, especially if you're in a bird uh, sanctuary. Does the same bluebird come back to that house the next year? Uh, Ron asked a question about, does the bluebird come back to the same house every year? You know, I, I don't have a scientific answer for that. Um, my guess is that they'll come to the same area uh, as they migrate. Uh, and they, if they have the, an un, unoccupied house when they reach that area, and these are the males that are, are kind of marking out their territory, that they would take that same that same um, house, but you know things change. Uh, another bird may have occupied it, and, and they will fight for their their rights to a nesting cavity. But you know they may not win that battle. So answer short answer is I don't know. Uh, but my guess is that it's certainly possible and likely that they would if it's been kept and maintained clean. Yeah, yeah. Is there is the rent lower? I don't know. Maybe in your neighborhood they might be. So, anyways, I, I tried to answer that the best I could. I don't have a definitive answer for it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, 
And this is where the data might come in. So, <clears throat> so I put up a bluebird nest. Uh, I observe my residents show up usually probably early April. They have a nest, probably have eggs in there by the end of April. Those guys fledge at least by the end of May. Do I clean out that original nest in hopes to get a second clutch or do I leave the nest uh, to save them some time? Uh, most most uh, bird uh, organizations recommend you clean out a bluebird box. Um, and the reason is, is that I, I, the, 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 the birds, the babies attract mites and those mites uh, will stay in the nesting material. And the, the, the parents, if they want to come back and have another brood cycle, they, they know it. I mean, they, they get bitten. So I think if you remove the nesting material between uh, nesting uh, periods, uh, you're better off. Now, again, birds have bird brains, and so they don't always do that. They may reoccupy the same nesting material. Now, the, the, the female will probably redo some of the nesting to change the de decor a little bit, but I've seen both. But I think if you were to give a, a single answer, it would be recommended to remove that nesting material to uh, allow, to encourage the birds to build again, bluebirds to build again, and it will be relatively mite free that second and third, you know, however many times uh, they come and uh, breed. Uh, so you'll have clean nest material to start off the next, the next cycle. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would add, uh, Ron talked about posts and things like that. In my experience, uh, as far as uh, ease of install, um, cheap uh, material, uh, I really like just using a three quarter inch piece of conduit, the EMT, uh, it's weather resistant. Um, I don't know what the current price is, but uh, usually cheaper than a T-post. And then using U-clips to attach that to the um, uh, piece of EMT that you're gonna pound into the ground. Um, attaching a flat board to a, a ribbed uh, T-post is not always the easiest thing to do. So, um, EMT has worked really well, uh, or conduit for me at my house. I like the idea, uh, especially when you start thinking about, you know, expenditures, uh, a post, definitely good. Now I will add to that, Josh, I think great idea, but when it's amazing that snakes, uh, and, and I don't know about squirrels, but they can climb small poles. Uh, so you really do want the predator guard on that to, to, kind of reduce the incidence of a predator getting in and disturbing the nest. Uh, sure. so, yeah. But it, it attached to a piece of conduit. Yeah, and it makes it easy because conduit is easily drilled through as opposed to T-post. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I definitely see the, the advantage, uh, advantage of using a conduit, so. All right, well, does any in our uh, audience here have any questions? We're just now at one o'clock. So uh, I asked all that uh, and added all that I could think of, but if you guys have any additional questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, shoot away. Sounds like we must have covered everything there, Mike, because nobody's speaking up. Uh, sign of either a good presentation or a bad presentation. Maybe everyone fell asleep. Here we go. Annette uh, has got raising her hand, it looks like. So Annette, go ahead and uh, ask your question if you want to unmute. Oh. that or you can always uh, type your question into the chat and that. Or maybe that wasn't raising hand, maybe that was waving by, I don't know. Oh.
Yeah, right. I see well, it. Yep. Still muted. Oh, just meant to give thumbs up. All right. Oh, okay. That was just a thumbs up. Hey, thank you, Annette. Uh, and we certainly enjoy sharing this uh, knowledge. Uh, that's what we do in the Master Gardeners and in the UGA Extension. Uh, we want to help uh, others uh, and share what we know about subjects related to gardening and, and, and uh, uh, you know, nat the naturalist environment. So, uh, all right, well, thank you much for allowing us to do this presentation. Thank you, Josh. Uh, and we had a, a, a blast doing it. So uh, we hope you guys enjoy uh, building some birdhouses. And if you wanna, if you want to uh, get involved, please do. And if you wanna build birdhouses for us, uh, for, for our county, Cherokee County, let us know. Uh, Josh Fooder, I'm sure will take anything that uh, you're willing to offer and we will put it up in uh, one of the parks here in the, in the, in the county or city uh, and be, be proud to have you as a, as a uh, uh, colleague in, in this project. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, weekend. Go dogs and go pokes. And we will see you uh, next <laughs> month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.